Good early afternoon. We are live. I'm silencing my phone. You joined us on the Blue Plate Special here in Orange Beach, Alabama at the Wharf. I'm Andy Andrews. We have a great show planned for you today. Um, going to tell you a trade in just a minute that is going to blow your mind. I uh, we're just I, I'm amazed. So hey Matt, could you put up uh, the what you call it the link in just a few minutes the link to um, Youth Reach Gulf Coast just in a few minutes just kind of be ready for it if you can. If you're new to us and you're here on Facebook with us for the first time, please click that notification button and turn the notifications on on your phone so that if we go live from Wisdom Harbor for anything, you'll be notified. Um, and YouTube, click that subscription button there. In fact, just have all your friends just click that subscribe button on the YouTube channel. It'll help us, okay? Um, hey, Jeff Herring, how are you doing? What are you? You're officially a grandfather? You're not old enough to be a grandfather. Hey, Kim Petrucki, how are you doing? Congratulations, Jeff. That's awesome. Heather, Bruce Yates. Hey, Bonnie Nix from Kentucky. George Kosser. Jews DeWitt from, oh man, from Washington State. Look at you, Texas, headed to L.A. Yep, good. L.A., headed to L.A., lower Alabama. Mm, good. Um, Corey, hey, man, how are you doing? Sandra from Searcy, Arkansas, where Harding University is, where they killed their mascot and ate it. Uh, Joseph from uh, Brisbane in Queensland, Australia. Okay, what time is it there? I think, aren't you a day ahead of us? I think you're a day ahead of us. So how is our day going to be since you've already experienced it? We're just curious. Hey, Sean, how are you doing? Dave, um, Listen, we got some, we got some good stuff. We're just gonna we're gonna get into it. Oh, you like my shirt? This shirt is from Sand Dollar Lifestyles. Right here, they are the cornerstone of this shopping complex we call the Wharf. Um, and if if you're if you join us here, if you come, we have people out in the studio today. So hey guys, have you seen the? Uh, now they're paying attention to Austin. Austin's out there talking. You are, we're doing a show here. Can you pay attention to me? Austin, so I, he, he was pointing out Sand Dollar Lifestyle, wasn't he? Okay. Make sure you take your pictures on the escalator statues. Yeah. Okay. Isn't that incredible? Yes. Okay. My sister, Christy, is here. Um, Sandra, so glad you're here. Danette, okay. Let me, let me just, uh, let me tell you. We got, uh, this is a perfect shirt to wear today, by the way, you know. Um you, we, I mean, because you're wanting people to be kind to you when people have taken some right hooks at me. Um, Cat Hooker, how are you? You got the, I mean, of everybody that joins us on Blue Plate Special right now, Cat Hooker has uh, my favorite name. I just think that is just, I think it's hilarious. Um, anyway, there's somebody in, where are you? From Green Lake, Wisconsin. They ain't nothing green up in Wisconsin right now, is there? I mean, it's all white. Okay, Marcy Crossley Trader, you ready? I, I mean, wait, Marcy Crossler Taylor. That was, that's a hard name to say sometimes. Yes, it is trade day. And uh, I wanted to, it, it, Matt, if you can just put a link there, I want everybody to know what the trading is going on for. Gene McDonald, how are you? If you haven't seen, if you don't know who Gene McDonald is, you need to go on YouTube and put up Gene McDonald on YouTube and just watch some of these videos. The guy is incredible. Hey, Jerry, how are you? Jerry Anderson, my good buddy. Um, okay, so the trades, the trades are going to go on all year long, and this is for Youth Reach Gulf Coast. Because at the end of the year, whatever we end up with, we're going to uh, auction off and uh, we're going to donate the money to Youth Reach Gulf Coast. So you see the link there. If you guys would, please take some time today, click that link, and just scan the first three or four paragraphs. It, it'd take you 60 seconds, but I want you to, to know who this is. These people receive 
zero federal funding, and they do not charge any of the families or the 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 boys that 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 go there. I mean, no federal funding, and they don't charge. Okay, so we're helping, and um, uh, so the trade we decided we we're going to start at the first of the year. So the very first blue plate special of the year, we had a safety pin. And so that's where we started. We started with a safety pin. And I said, what are we going to trade this for? And I had several people tell me I was stupid, but I've had people tell me I was stupid for years and years and years. Uh, so we tra I traded that safety pin before the next show for five acorns. Five. And I planted them in little cups, and I traded those for something else, then something else, then something else. And so, Matt, are we on our 14th trade? Is this 14 or 15? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. I think it's either 14 or 15. Okay? So to be absolutely exact, it's either 14 or 15. And um, so let me tell you where we are. It's kind of scary because I I've got to make two trades a week. Right, I mean, between every blue plate. Now, I didn't. I, I, I the first time I stumbled was last before the last show. But we haven't stumbled now. Uh, the last thing we had was the. Uh, could you show us the television, Matthew? Could you show them? We have. Uh, this is what we traded, and the trade came in came together last night. This was an eighty-five inch. Sony Smart TV, Smart TV 4K with voice controls that would even connect with your uh, thermostat, your lights, and your toilet. So a television that would flush your toilet. What do you think about that? I mean, it just don't get any better than that. And so this, uh, that was the trade. And we had... Um, we had we had that, and so last night, a sponsor of uh, the podcast, actually, uh, an occasional sponsor of the podcast, Dr. Barb Rimbiosa, I can't believe I said your name wrong, I'm sorry, Dr. Barb Rimbiosa, who is the founder and CEO of ITAM, I-T-I, how do you spell it, Matt? I T. What? Say again. I A I T A M. Put that on there too. Dot org. Dot org. Okay. We pronounce it ITAM, but they spell it differently. I don't really understand that. But Dr. Barb is one of my favorite people, and she's like my one of my double favorite people now because boy, she offered an unbelievable trade last night. And you need to go back in the archives of the professional notice of the podcast and see the one where Dr. Barb Rimbiesa was our guest. It was great. Okay, so here's what we have now. Put the, put the picture up there, Matt. 100 ounces of silver. This is a 100-ounce bar of silver. I mean... It's just, so, according to silver prices, right this minute, man, Mac Richard, I'm talking to you. According to silver prices, right this minute, that silver bar is worth three thousand two hundred and sixty-seven dollars and seventy-one cents. So basically. Somebody somewhere has a $3,200 safety pin somewhere. But that's what we got to trade. Okay, this is what we have to trade. And we have to do it before Tuesday. So come on, you guys. This is for this is for youth reach. And, you know, like the guy, when I was growing up in Dothan, Alabama, there was some car dealership and they would they had this goober on there and he would say, Come on in, make a trade. We trade anything from steamboats to belly goats. And so that's kind of where we are now. Um, but a, a 100 ounces 
a, a silver bar that's 100 ounces. And so, come on, people, what do you got? What do you got to trade? Don't make me stand out at the fairgrounds in front of a carnival going, you know, we have a silver bar. It's yours for the taking. Um, but we need your offers in. Okay, we need all your offers in. Um, let's let's uh, switch here. You know about the Dr. Seuss thing. I mean, you know what, what's been happening, and uh, and so you know what? I had a friend after after the show the other day, after the blue plate the other day. A friend, I, I was talking to him. He said, "Hey, watch the show." I said, "Yeah, yeah." It was kind of, you know, I said, it took me a minute, you know. And he said, what? Well, it took you a little longer than a minute. I said, I know, I know. Um, he said, it, it looks like your, uh, your, your little poem touched the third rail. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, looks to me like um, you were talking about censorship or that was what you were intending to talk about and that was what you were intending to poem be about but you touched that third rail on that uh, uh, deeply divisive topic that is a conversation going on in America today of racism and I said well yeah I mean I didn't I, I didn't mean to get into that I mean that because I I mean that's to me, that to to me and my family, that's kind of a settled topic, you know. I mean, that's that's not something we're about, and we our friends aren't like that. And so he said, he said, "Well, you're a communicator, aren't you?" And I said, "Well, I'm supposed to be." And, and he said, "Well, come on, man." He said, "You need to nail it down. What are you after?" And I said, yeah, yeah, okay. I said, I, I said, censorship is the deal to me. And he said, all right. I mean, this, you know, this is a good friend, right? This, is, I mean, this is a good friend. Good friends don't always, you know, pat you on the back and tell you how great you are. Um, and he said, you know, well, come on, you know, if that's your topic, it took you thirty minutes to get to it the other day. I'm like, yeah, okay, all right, I got you. And so. One of the things that I wanted to tell you guys today is that censorship is my topic. <laughs> this is what I'm against, okay? Now, it has gotten kind of crazy on social media, and we've gotten some some uh, letters. And uh, I'm reminded of several things when I, when I, I read some of these. First of all, you know, it's hard to get it's hard to get comments where people are disagreeing with you in a mean way, okay? Or you know, just threatening you, or so that's hard to get. But I got to tell you this: the thing that distress distresses me more than anything about these past few days is that what has, for the most part, been a pretty peaceful bunch of people. Um, you know, all of a sudden there's there's people yakking, and then other people yakking back at them, and and so, you know, my my whole thing is, hey, we got to figure out how to have a conversation. You know, I mean, that's what we got to do because we got to find some agreement points. I've always thought we have kind of a leadership void in America because. Uh, the essence of leadership is influence, and the essence of influence is agreement, not disagreement. Yeah, you know, we're never we're not we just don't follow people, or we don't stay around people that we just massively disagree with. So, you find something that you agree with, and you do it in a in a kind way, and especially when you move into the areas that you you disagree with, and so. I, I want to tell you about a lady that sent me a letter. I, I mean, you know, it just went all over the map the other day. But I only, I'm going to read you one message that I got today, and I'm going to comment on it, 
and I have already I've already uh, sent a message back to her. Uh, the lady's name is Lisa Foster, and I have no idea where she lives or anything. But she she sent a great letter. All right, a great message to me, disagreeing with me. All right, but I was reminded once again uh, of how classy people act. And this is a very classy lady, obviously, okay? Um, so I was reminded once again of how classy people act and how classy people treat each other. And I was also reminded, and I have been reminded a lot uh, over the past few days, uh, one is a, a story that I want to tell you about a television show I was on that kind of floored me when it was over. But the other thing I want to tell you is something uh, – the boys and I were having a conversation. My boys and I were having a conversation not too long ago, and I, and I it, somehow it got around to advice we have gotten in our lives, and and I told them I said, you know, I think the best piece of advice, the most useful piece of advice that I have gotten in my entire life, the one that I I had to kind of figure out, and then I still continue to work with it, and I have to remember it, and I apply it. I, it's, if there's one piece, it is what Jones told me when he said, you can't believe everything you think. It's a wonderful piece of advice because it's, it, it, it's the wise people who continue to search who continue to listen, who continue to learn and continue to think through something because what they think may, may not be complete or may not even be accurate. Um, it may have changed. You can't believe everything you think, uh, you know, even rules. I mean, there was a time in your life when don't cross the street by yourself was a perfectly you know, reasonable rule. And if you were thinking that at a time in your life, that was a good thing to think. But there comes a time when that, that rule is no longer appropriate, you know. But if you're still living your life with the same rules and the same thoughts you had years ago, you know, life gets kind of crazy. And so it was something, it's something that I have to keep in the top of my mind. You can't believe everything you think. Right? I mean, have you ever been, have you ever, you believed something and you knew it and you, you could argue it and you could, you could win the argument every time. And then you found out a little later, you know, a month later, a year later, oh, that wasn't exactly correct. Have you ever done that? Or, you know, my, my information wasn't exactly uh, complete. Well, of course, we, we've all done that. And so, okay, so if, You've ever done that before. Does the possibility exist that something you believe now, your information is not complete or it might not be right or true? Does that possibility exist? And, of course, you would say, well, Andy, of course, that possibility exists. Okay, I agree. That's, and I have to remind myself that possibility exists because the point is we don't really know what the subject is, do we? We don't really know what part of whatever it is we believe that might not be complete, right? Might be wrong. And so, you know, there's a whole world out there that we continue to think through. So you can't believe everything you think. All right, now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop as I go because I love Lisa Foster's letter because <clears throat> it, it was, like, was kind of like when I read it, first of all, I wasn't horrified or I wasn't, you know, nervous or I didn't, I mean, it was just like a friend that, hey, I, you know, not, you're, you're full of it. You know, I, I disagree with you, but here's why. You know, she did this with a smile. I mean, I, I don't even know what she looks like or where she lives, but she's my friend, all right, because she disagreed with me with a smile. And so here's what she said, and I'm going to tell you kind of how I, um, because I think this is a great uh, example 
of communication between people who disagree. Because we got to talk about stuff, you guys. So, uh, anyway, I'm going to tell you kind of what, how I was thinking as I read. She says, Andy, I've been a longtime reader and follower of yours. While I disagree with your stance on the issue of Dr. Seuss and censorship, I appreciate the way you are attempting to discuss the disagreement. Thank you. That was nice. I mean, that's what I thought. It would be easy for me just to unfollow your Facebook page, but I really don't want to. I do, however, want to explain where you and I disagree. Okay? Well, I'm already interested, right? She says, I do not see the issue as censorship. I, like you, as a historian, am not a fan of censorship. She says, you're exactly right in saying that placing information in the dark, no matter how foul it is, is not a good thing for democracy. All right, and I think about that. I mean, right off the bat, she says, hey, we disagree about some stuff. Now, you're right about this. Okay, so, I, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm into this letter now when I'm reading it the very first time. She said, however, again, I don't believe the issue with the Dr. Seuss books is censorship. So I'm thinking, uh, okay, talk, talk to me then. She goes on. She said, unfortunately, in today's political climate, the term censorship has been politicized. It's easy for politicians and the media to claim censorship without taking the time to really understand and digest the issue. In many cases, they actually intend to make us angry and divide us. All right, now remember this place. We're going to come back here, okay? She says, so my question to you is, what do you consider censorship? She says, when I think of censorship, I think of book burnings and destroying information so that it can't be accessed. That is not what happened with these books. The publisher just decided not to publish them. Okay, remember this part too. We're going to come back here. She says, Nobody that I know of is burning or destroying them. She says, You can still go to the library and find them, if they even had them in the first place, if the library removed them, and then we had book burning so people could almost never get their hands on them, then that would be censorship. She said, Here's a really good article by a librarian about the topic. And the article really is good, and it's a school library journal, and it's about the Seuss library policies and stuff, okay? And um, so we're going back here. But she, she says, uh, the books are still out there if we want to learn through them, but as a whole, the racial stereotypes they portray are not wholesome or good for children. She says, what about books like Little Black Sambo? Being raised in the South, surely you know of that book. I have no idea if it's still being published. No, I don't think it should be banned, she says, but I can definitely understand if it's no longer being published or being read to children. She says, I study the United Daughters of the Confederacy and the Ku Klux Klan. They published a booklet in the early 1900s that popularized the Klan as heroes and defenders of the South. It's a disgustingly racist piece of work. I can get my hands on a copy in archives if needed for my historical research, but I can't imagine anyone publishing it today. Is that censorship? Um, and so she says, thank you, Lisa Foster. I have seen some of that stuff from the 1900s, and I agree. It is, uh, it's disgusting and racist. And... She, she can get her hands on a copy of it in archives if it's needed for her historical research. She says, is that censorship? And I agree with her. No, that's not censorship because it's still accessible. All right. Um, I also, it's, it's kind of curious to me, uh, well, I'll, get, I'll get to that point in a minute. Let's go back to that first place we stopped. Where, because this is, this is very curious, because there are a couple of things 
that she said that made me go, okay, buddy, come on now. You can't believe everything you think. And so, come on, dig deep on this. And remember, it's censorship that I'm about. And so, I, I'm always, I, I, it's so to go to the bottom of the pool on something, you can't just say, are you against censorship? Yes. Okay, well, there you go. Is censorship bad? Yes, it is. Okay, well, there you go. You know, uh, it should never happen. It should never happen. It's just like, I, I mean, it, it's not a simple matter. Because at some point, somebody has to say, how does this happen? I mean, how, how does it happen? I mean, no, you know, there's, there's, if you read history, there's no case that somebody just like all of a sudden out of the blue just walked out one day and said, okay, these are the, these are the books that uh, are no longer, you, you, we're going to burn them, we're going to hide them. We're, I mean, nobody does that. I mean, it's never been done. It, it's done, it's done like, like this. This is how censorship is done. You know what that is? That is one bite of this. You know what this is? This was a tree that was that big around, and the beavers, this bite came out right around there. It, the, the, but the beavers took that. Now, if, you, if you've ever seen what beavers can do to a, a, a huge area of land, you look at that devastation, you go, hey, nobody ever thinks about this. Nobody, nobody ever thinks it started this way. Okay? What Lisa did in her, um, in her letter to me, she prompted me, because see, at some point, you know, when two people disagree... There's, uh, there's, there's one of a couple of things happening when two people disagree. One of them could be, well, there's a difference in opinion. Okay, you know, you like blue carpet, I like green carpet. Okay, and you can compromise on opinion. But, but the other thing that happens when, when two people disagree that, a lot of times we don't consider is somebody doesn't know the truth. And you know what? Usually it's both of them. I heard somebody say one time, there's three sides to every story, your side, my side, and the truth. And so remember what we're trying to get to. That's, this is what, you know, a, a huge life focus of mine. My, my mission in life is to help people live the lives they would live if they only knew how to do it. Well, you know, that includes me and my family too, right? So I, I'm still searching, I'm still seeking to dig deeper into principle. But you and I, even if we just crazily disagree on a ton of things, there's a couple of things we agree on. One thing is we want the best for our country. We want the best for our children. And so the best, remember, is one thing. That's always one thing, the best. We're not talking about the best for you and the best for me, just the, the best. We want, do you want the best for your children? Yes. Okay, well, that's one thing. And so... Um, you know, we're not talking about some of the best or among the best of the decade. It's the best. Well, if you want the best, then you got to find the truth, which there can be different categories, but in each category is one thing. And so if you really want the best, not just, not just hey, I want my way, okay? If I really want the best, then that means I'm willing to search and I'm willing to listen and I'm willing to move if somebody can show me reason to move or send me in a direction to learn something else, okay? So here's what happened as I, as I read this letter. Now, first thing, um, she gets here and she goes, um, in many cases, they actually intend, the politicians and the media, they intend 
to make us angry and divide us. And I immediately went, yeah, yeah, no kidding. That's exactly right. Because I've seen, you know, the politicians, they want to make us angry and divide us so that we'll stand up and stomp and vote for them and try to make everybody vote for them. I mean, they, they obviously want But then the media, too, it's like, well, where's that? Well, you know what? I was on a major network show. It's probably the biggest show I've ever been on in my life. And when it was over, it went really good, and the producer came up to me, and the producer was a, a, a woman, and she said to me, she said, that was awesome. She said, is there any other topic that you do that you, you, you're passionate about that you can lay out? And, and I said, yeah, yeah. And, and I, I, I thought immediately, I said, parenting, I'm real passionate about that. And I said, I've got some parenting stuff that I believe is principally based that when I explain it, n- nobody would disagree. They would, they would go, Wow, because I've really thought to the bottom of the pool on this. And I, I really think every time I lay it out, even people who never heard of it or have disagreed before, I can lay it out and they go, wow, okay, yeah, that's, that's the truth. And she said, do you have anything, do you have anything that, like, you know, a couple of our hosts would agree with and a couple of our hosts would disagree with and then they could argue about it? And I so. So you don't want something that will help people that everybody could understand and agree with and and it would help everybody? And she said, no. <laughs> I knew then. I said, I, I am not long for network TV. Um, so they do. They, I mean, it's their money to, to, to divide us and make us angry. And so Lisa said, well, I'm going to go here and then I'll tell you what I really learned that is just shocking, I think will shock you. You know, where Lisa said, hey, uh, if the library removed them and we had book burning so people could never get their hands on them, that would be censorship. Okay, and she said, here's a really good article. So I read the article, and it is a really good article. There is, however, one line in there where the, uh, the lady who wrote the article, it, and it's a great article, but there's one line that says, as public institutions, libraries must abide by the First Amendment and cannot remove books because we disagree with the ideas in those books, that would be censorship. So I thought, well, so all the libraries are keeping the books, those six books? But a pretty quick Google search will show you Chicago Public Library removing six Dr. Seuss books. Uh, In Virginia, local public libraries have started removing books from iconic children's orthodoxies due to their racist and insensitive imagery. Uh, Connecticut librarians praise decision to remove Dr. Seuss books. And so, so that's this. That's what this is. Now, you know where Lisa said... They intend to make us angry and divide us. And she said, when I think of censorship, I think of information that cannot be accessed. That's not what happened with these books. The publisher just decided not to publish them. You know what? She's right. But I got to tell you this, when I found out she's right, I found out some more stuff I didn't know and probably some stuff Lisa didn't know, but she shaded toward it when she said they actually intend to make us angry and divide us. As I looked at this, I thought, you know, I've written books. I know publishers. I know how they work. And I know, 
you know, I, there were a lot of people, because when you, you get into a, a disagreement with somebody, you don't want to let that disagreement turn into an argument. An argument is where it's like just rage and craziness, and it's going, you know, you're hitting the third rail. And what I meant, well, that's what you said. You know, it's a disagreement. It's not an argument until things kind of get crazy. Okay, so, so you know, I... I was seeing stuff like the family decided, well, no, the family didn't decide to do this, you know, because Dr. Seuss uh, died in 91 and uh, his first wife died in 67 and his second wife, Audrey Seuss, created the Seuss Enterprises in 93 and she died in 2008. And so no family decided to do this because there ain't no family because they didn't have any kids. And Seuss Enterprises is, is, is a moneymaker and they use it like a trust and they do, but it's run by a, a lady named Susan Brandt and they didn't decide. It was the publishers that decided. And so there's people say, well, the publishers, you know, they just decided to do it just out of nowhere. Well, well, they, they know, no. They were under quite a bit of pressure, and so if you read the articles closely and you, you, you try to determine what's the truth, well, the, the publishers actually finally decided, this is what we're told, is they finally decided to get a group of experts and to go through all these books and decide which ones are the most offensive and which ones we should not post. So the publisher, Penguin Random House, stands up and says, we have decided because these books are so hurtful and so, you know, and listen, I'm not saying they're not, okay? But this is what, this, just get, hang with me here for a second. This is what they said, because it's so hurtful that we have decided we're not going to publish these anymore. And so all of a sudden, there's this, you know, there's an outcry, there's libraries taking them out, Okay, which is this, is the beginning of that censorship thing. Uh, if it's not outright, it's the beginning, right? And so we talked the other day, we're going to so, but here's, here's what is very curious to me. I have some publishing contacts, and so I actually went undercover and got some information that, uh, that an author I'm not supposed to be able to get, okay? And so I'm just going to tell you a little information that I think will be very curious to you, that out of all the books that Dr. Seuss has written, what are the odds that the most offensive ones would be the six least selling books in the catalog? So, if I ran this, this is last year, okay, and this has been getting lower and lower and lower every year, but this is last year, and this is according to the book scan that tracks this for publishers and uh, some reporting bookstores and some uh, media, okay? But somebody like this, I, I'm not supposed to be able to get this information. You're not supposed to be able to get this information. You, you know, I, I, can't, I cannot tell you how many of my books sold last week. But they can look at this and they can tell how many sold last hour. Okay? So last year, if I ran the zoo, sold 6,395 books. All right, now, now listen, in 2020, last year, Dr. Seuss, Penguin... Penguin Random House sold more than 5 million Dr. Seuss books. Okay, so if I ran the zoo, sold 6395. And to think I saw it on Mulberry Street, sold 5,258. Miguel Agat's Pool sold 4,374. On Beyond Zebra sold 2,942. Scrambled Eggs Super sold 1,685, and the Cat's Quizzer 257. That's the worldwide sales on those books. And I got to tell you something, no kidding, they're not publishing them anymore. Because if I put out a book 
that only sells 6,000 books, the number one on that list of six, if I put out a book that only sells 6,000 books, I don't get another contract. And so here is what I believe happened, has happened, okay? And this is why we can't believe everything we think. And this, it, this I, I think that the censorship is, is never an immediate grab. It occurs within a society very gradually. And knowing that no democracy can survive censorship, because if there is censorship, voters can't make decisions based on truth. They can only make decisions based upon whatever passes through the filter of censorship. Okay, so here we have this happened. And what they decided to do is we're not going to say just we're canceling it because it costs us more to print the books than they're selling. We're going to make ourselves look good, and we're going to say it was because of this. And then all of a sudden, you know, the argument is away. It's off and running. And and whereas nobody, you know, would have thought of maybe, you know, getting rid of the books. Now there's libraries getting rid of the books. The eBay will not sell these six books, eBay won't sell them. Now think about that. eBay won't sell them. Why? Because they didn't sell very much for the publisher? No. The publisher didn't tell the truth as to why they were getting, getting rid of them. And so then they put out a false narrative. And so now eBay, won't, eBay, eBay, will, pub, eBay will allow people to sell... Adolf Hitler's work and Joseph Stalin's work, but eBay won't allow anybody to sell these six books. And so because of misinformation, this starts happening. So nothing is as poisonous to a democratic population as censorship. And it starts a little bit. See, censorship prevents democracy. If a censorship already exists in a place then it only does so by means of, uh, of, of censorship. If a dicta dictator's, you know, uh, I guess a, a place, a, an authentic um, democracy, it can have no censorship because the idea that censorship can be justified in some circumstances, it, that's a lie that dictators always use. It's the only way they can continue to exist. So how do we fight lies? We're closing up here. How do we fight lies? How do we, what do we, what do we look at? Because the stuff is obviously wrong. It, you know, when, when Lisa said in here, I thought this was very well put, but she said, um, she said, hey, you're from the South. What about books like Little Black Sambo? Surely you know about that book. I have no idea if it's being published. No, I don't think it should be banned, but I can definitely understand if it's no longer being published or being read to children. You know, here's the thing. It's not being published, okay, which is fine. I mean, that's fine because one of my, Tommy, one of my best buddies, I see Tommy four or five times a week, and, and Tommy's African-American, and I... I you know, I wouldn't have a little black sambo in my house because I, I wouldn't, you know, I mean, I'm sure I don't get it like Tommy gets it. Right? I mean, I just look at it and go, that's that's wrong. That should not be around today. You know, we all understand how grandparents and great-grandparents and all like that, but all we can do is today. Okay, and so I, I look at that and I go, you know, I have a lot of uh, antiques and stuff, but I, I, I don't have that. I'm not going to have that because I wouldn't hurt Tommy for anything in the world. I, I don't really have him even think about that around me or any time I can control him, you know, thinking about that. Any time I can, you know, that's why... I, that's, that's why in a free society, responsibility is so huge because 
we can voluntarily give up some of our freedom for our brothers and sisters. And maybe, you know, it, that we do that when we're around somebody who is an alcoholic, don't we? I mean, if we have you ever gone in a place and go, no, are they going to be there? We should not. We should not even have anything tonight because we don't. I mean, so we're giving up a lot of our freedom because we love them. Okay, well, the same goes with this stuff. But I'll tell you this, we can't ban it. We can't ban it because it's, it's, it's ironic that Lisa mentioned Little Black Sambo because there was a time when Austin and Adam were very young that I saw that book somewhere, and we, Polly and I grabbed that book and sat down real quick with the boys and said, now look at this. This is how this used to be done. You know, the children's books you read now, you know, the, the ones we read now. Um, this is what little children used to see. Now, and we showed it to them when we ate that. Because, see, it's important that we don't get rid of this history. Because it only took a few minutes to put something in their mind that they would not tolerate. Uh, they, okay, they know this is not good for children. And so, you know, anytime you, you see something like that, uh, you know, if there's something in a book or a, a pl thing you, that you find offensive, then this is a great opportunity to make sure that this doesn't happen with the next generation. Okay, but if we have several generations and they never see stuff, this is why history repeats itself. Because, they, you know, they don't know. They don't know. We want to make sure they know. And so I really want to thank uh, Lisa for sending this letter. I think this is, I think this is important. I think... Hopefully, we've kind of gotten, we've narrowed this thing today, and, and we kind of understand where we are. And, you know, I don't, I, I don't see any reason we've talked more about Dr. Seuss or, or this kind of stuff anymore. But I'll tell you this, the conversation will continue on disagreements, how to disagree Okay, we'll talk more about that because as Americans, we need to figure out how to be more on the front porch, listening, maybe uncomfortably sometimes, but being kind, more on the front porch and less in the backyard with the privacy fence with only the people who think like we do. Because if we only mm, are around people who think like we do, and you can't believe everything you think. Where does that leave us? So we're after wisdom, a deeper understanding of principle. Thank you guys for being here. And remember, we need some trade offers. Come on, guys. Bye-bye.